My name is Neil Burridge. Welcome to my sword corner. Over the last 20 years I've made a lot of these. I've seen a lot of swords in museums and I've learned a lot and I'd like to share it with you. Okay, welcome back for another video. Um, we're going to look at um, Wilburton's sword. Um, many years ago when uh, I started, I was doing a um, workshop for a young archaeologist in Aylesbury, run by a lovely chap called Brett Thorne. And uh, at the end of the day, we cast sort of some bronze axes and did some really nice stuff with his uh, young archaeologists. And he said, would you like to come to my museum and see all my stuff? And I thought, oh, yeah. So we did. We went to uh, Aylesbury Museum and, and he gave me a guided tour and it's really interesting. And he did say, we have this sword and you're welcome to come and have a look at it. But it's in storage, so we have to have an appointment. So I went to see it. And it's an incredible sword, and, and this is a copy of it. Um, it's one of the most preserved swords in the country. It's, the surface has every last little mark. I've mentioned it in one of the earlier films. The surface is preservation shows every scratch and every hammer mark and everything the um, maker of the sword did. Um, and it's... Um, yeah, quite profound sword to see and, and you realise how much work had gone in forging through parts of the handle um, where they tiptoed over the uh, casting floor in the edge so they didn't make it any worse. Um, and I found it quite interesting. Anyway, I made a copy of it about, oh, it must be 12, 15 years ago. It was a long time ago. And uh, I was never really truly happy with it. And then recently I've been commissioned to make this for the museum. So they send me more information, um, much more detailed than I took when I was doing stuff then. Um, and uh, I set about making the sword. So because of the size of the sword, it, it's not a sword that many people order because it's only, I think, 55 centimetres without the handle on. So it's... it's kind of a, a unique journey for me to um, go back to the sword and make it again. So I was going to look at the finer details of this. The Wilburton period is kind of the beginning of the very late, you got Wilburton, um, before that I think it's Pennard, and it, it's all a bit variable, the different sword typing, and I'm not good on sword typologies. But the hordes that turn up in this period are quite amazing. There's the Islam horde in uh, Cambridgeshire. There is the Wilburton horde. And there's something called the Blackmore Selborne horde as well, which huge piles of broken swords. And uh, But the Selborne Blackmore horde is quite amazing because it shows the transition between this type of sword to the slightly later Europe Park and it's got all the transition across. So if you were to ask me which bit of the late Bronze Age do you like most, I would go yes, the Wilburton period because the spears are amazing. I mean it's blinged up, there's lots of bronze bling at this time and, and they re they're reflected in the horde, they mount a weaponry and in the hordes as well, they tend to have unusual stuff that nobody really knows what they are. Tiny little trinkets and sword fittings. But until somebody finds a sword with the fitting attached to it, it's hard to work out what they're for. So we're going to have a closer look at this because I quite like this one. I'm going to put it down in front of the camera so you can see the handle. So we're going to have a look at this. So they're different from the later Europe parks. They tend to have 
wider flanges on the handle. Um, they tend to have more pronounced shoulders at the top here in the handle and they also have very pronounced cutouts here on some of the bigger blades if I get another one just to show you um, same again big cutouts through the handle and what I haven't done here is the hollow cast section that goes down the middle of the handle remember these swords are cast through the tip of the blade and that's why the handles are so delicate because they don't need to pass the metal through so once you get to the Ewart Park swords is they're casting them through the handle and they have to be more substantial to get the flow through um, so that they're quite pronounced in shape and they tend to stand out noticeable from there. But it also means they're very stylish and they almost have like an art deco feel to them. So this one I've done with um, oak. I've done the handle in oak. And uh, it's quite hard sort to do because the rivets on this one are quite big. And it's quite a risky handle for me because you've only got short grain lengths either side of the rivet hole, which makes it a risky saw to um, rivet. So it's utmost care. So I've been practicing for 20 years and I've got much better at it. So it's possible that the sword in um, the museum at Aylesbury um, it's called the Ivanhoe Beacon Sword. Maybe had bone handle insets because I think the rivets are still shorter than this. The problem is I couldn't reliably handle it with what I've got without, if I went any thinner, it would cause it to crack. So the other thing we're looking for is how it was held. So it was either held like this or like this. But um, it fits comfortably in the hand, and that's what you want it to do. The blade's beautifully forged. And another thing about the Wilburton blades is that it tends to push the widest part to, more towards the end in a leaf-bladed form. Um, it just seems that, maybe it's just my imagination, but they seem to push this widest part is predominantly a little bit further. I mean, earlier on I said the parallels between the Ewart Park blades and the um, Wilburton blades, they're very, very similar, but there's just a tiny bit more push towards the end here. But if you had a Ewart Park with a short point on it, it would look very similar to this. But you wouldn't recognise it as a Ewart Park if it had these deep, cutouts and curves and bold shoulders so that's that's quite interesting um i think this one's um somewhere around 55 centimeters if i remember correctly and it's not a huge sword there was much bigger swords around at this time and that's what i find quite interesting this sword was made this size deliberately for a reason so it wasn't they couldn't make it any bigger they wanted it this size so that's an interesting fact um so we're back again um so i've just kind of shown you how stylish they are and that kind of art deco feel um i don't think i'll be making one of these for a long time but i just kind of like it and it's special for me that uh, it was one of the first swords i got to see close up and and what kind of um, inspired me to to learn more and to go forwards in it. The first time I cast this sword 15 years ago was actually with a young archaeology group. And I had two um, young lads, I think they were around 12, cast the sword with under my supervision. And uh, it was quite nice to go from 
to, to put the input into young people and give them the experience of uh, seeing what it's like to cast a sword and bring the sword back in a way from sort of 3,000 years ago. The hordes are really amazing. It's worth looking out for the Iselum Horde, um, the Blackmoor Selborne Horde, and uh, <clears throat> um, what's the other one? And the Wilburton Horde, hugely loaded with spears. After this, there's a change in, um, as it drifts more towards the Ewart Park phase, the spears seem to get smaller and smaller. Um, they don't have these huge, blingy, um, wonderful spears in the Ewart Park period that you do with these swords. So that's probably the reason it makes it. You also get um, spear ferrules, which are like tubular fittings on the end of the spears. Um, there's all the usual axes, but the Selborne Horde was interesting for the number of bronze rings that were found with the Horde. And I have a feeling these are something to do with sword suspension, the way the sword was hung um, off the wearer. It's, it's hard because nobody's found the sword buried in situ. So I'm just going to put this down and pick up um, this one. This is more of Jess's beautiful work. Um, this is for a customer in Cambridge. He's been very patient and waited for ages for this. Um, so Jess has done this stunning bit of detail on the sword and the decoration. We'll look at the decoration under there. This was the customer's choice of decoration. Um, and he's an expert in um, late Bronze Age pottery, which is not highly decorated. So he wanted something that would be age appropriate in a decoration motif. Um, usually when we're doing these, we do the leather straps come in round and button or bronze, um, sorry, bone or bronze buttons to suspend them. So they would sit on the wearer, depending on what hand it is. So this is for right hand. But really nobody knows. The interesting thing is what turns up in the funny knobbly thing. Yeah, that's it. What turns up in the wash? And in these hordes you get some very strange objects so again this is um this is actually from the horde in uh, St Michael's Mount in Cornwall where I, not far from where you live um, and it's a combination of several things it's the only ever complete buckle ever found and it's got this middle section they call a bugle shaped object but it's only a representation of it it's not the hollow tube you normally get uh, this is just a miscast I've got kicking around my workshop um, so somewhere straps pass through but if you sit down with a piece of paper and try and work out what it does it just leaves you boggled um, and we've looked at the originals a couple of times now and it still leaves me boggled. But the interesting thing is, when I was looking at the um, Borton Malaby Horde and the Havering Horde, you see echoes of this in the Horde itself. So it's a, a buckle to do with sword suspension, I'm absolutely sure, due to the size of it. Um, possibly a way of hanging the the sword off a large belt or a wide strap at the shoulder so it's possible it's all something we can go into in the future so i'm going to have a look under under the uh close-up pictures you can have a look and the scabbard so yeah this is what they call a, a bugle shaped object on the um collections that you see and they turn up as random things but this is only like a token of it because usually they're tubular there's a hole all the way down the middle and and an open strap there 
But the interesting thing is, there's nothing been threaded down the inside of the intact ones because the coring is sometimes still in place. Um, these objects turn up in um, in the Havering hoard. They're usually parallel line decorations. There's my miserable fail uh, parallel line decorations on this. I um, mean, this is from about seven, eight years ago. Um, I'll just experiment in. Um, quite an interesting fitting but there there's recently in Scotland been a, a sword found in situ with horse fittings um, and it's all uh, still lifted in the block of earth that it was found in and it's probably going to reveal some interesting sword fittings in the scabbard when the excavation starts, but it's, that could be another six months to a year away. Um, as soon as I know, I'll talk to you. We're going to look at the um, um, scabbard next. Um, yeah, I just brought it up close. You can see the beautiful level of decoration by Jess here. Um, pretty amazing. It's hard to work out what was done in the past because nobody digs it up. But there's high hopes for the um, sword and scabbard fittings in Scotland to give us another insight. Another thing you see on um, Wilburton swords is what's called the chape. It's a long curved tubular bronze fitting. So what we done, because not all swords had it, there was no shape found with the Ivanhoe beacon sword, the one we're looking at. So they might have mimicked it in the end of the scabbard. But until somebody finds a scabbard that's fully intact, it's n we're never going to know. In Must Farm, one of the swords was broken and thrown into the river and the reason they think it was still in the scabbard is that when the sword was found the two pieces two broken pieces were touching on their side bent at right angles so the theory is that the sword was put across a knee bent until it snapped but the leather in the scabbard held on to it long enough so when they cast the sword into the water um, the two pieces landed in the river but sadly there was no organic preservation and all he ended up was the two halves of the sword forming a V lying on their sides in the river which is a bit of a shame because there's been so much organic preservation at um, uh, Must Farm it would have been perfect if a scabbard had turned up with um, more construction the Canusti scabbard was hazel this one's hazel as well and on the inside this one's been lined with a uh, calf skin but on the canoosty one it was just a strip of leather or fur down each side that rubbed down the back of the blade down the um, rib down the middle on both sides and then it was just plain um, hazel wood whereas this one has got a the calfskin lining, hazel core, and then um, the leather wrap as well. If you look, if you've ever tried making a scabbard, which I tried, and I found them uber difficult, and uh, I only admire Jess's work more and more because of this. Anyway, so this is a later York Park sword, and I just love doing this. Oh, it's the best bit. He does know how to make an exceedingly fine scabbard. Anyway, this is not finished. I've still got to uh, do the last bit. When I send swords off to get scabbards made, it, it seems much easier for Jess to have the handles removable so he can uh, work it all out easily. Anyway, I thought that was an interesting thing um, for you to uh, see. I do like this one. Be set apart. And really, I, I don't make swords for you. I make them for me. I make the sword I want to make. 
and sometimes it's very hard to part with them. So I just thought it was an interesting uh, parallel. Right, okay. So we're gonna have a quick round up. Um, so yeah, for me, it's, it, it's kind of a trip down memory lane to make this sword again and uh, bring it uh, alive. This one's for display, so it can't be sharp. Um, they didn't want too much point on the end. The original one um, did have quite a point on the end there, which was quite interesting. So, and somebody described it as wasp-like, and I thought, yeah, it's a good description. It is wasp-like. Um, so, as I said earlier, the Wilton period would be my choice of late Bronze Age um, interest, really, just for the sheer amount of blingy spears, bangles, gold. Really, they should have set King Arthur in the age of the Wilburton period. It would be much more exciting. Um, and I just find it interesting after this. I mean, it's all interesting, but to me, this is probably the, the one of the more interesting swordy periods just due to the the volume of material that's available in large hordes. I think the Islam horde is staggering in um, volume, if you look it up. I think it's 2,000 plus objects, and it just goes on forever. And the interesting thing is, a lot of it looks like it's new. So um, I'm hoping in the future to, to go and visit that one and, and have a closer look at it. It's, it's not one I've seen um, out of the case, but it would be nice to go through it. Um, so I'm going to leave it with you now and um, I hope you've uh, enjoyed this and, and gained something from it. And you had to quickly run off and look up the uh, Selborne um, Blackmore Horde, the Wilburton Horde and the... Um, Islam Horde. There's not a lot on the internet. It's all bits, a bit kind of academic. Um, and do some research. Thank you. I don't monetize my films. Um, the idea is to share my knowledge with you. So if you um, want to support me, you can buy me a cup of coffee in the link below. And if you could like, share, and hit the subscribe button, that'd be fantastic. Thank you.